Another theme in biology is biodiversity or the diversity of life. And that's largely what we're studying in this first part of Biology 1100, because we're looking at many different phyla. And you remember you did the, um, the, la the agile exercise where you identify different species using a dichotomous key. So we looked at a few of the phyla already and some of the classes. The diversity on Earth is remarkable. Um, I think about one 0.7 million species have been described, but the estimates of species on Earth are a lot greater than that, uh, 10 million or even more. There's many that we haven't discovered in hard to get to places. These are all um, sharks and rays, and they belong in the chondroichthyes. So not the bony fishes, the osteichthyes, but the chondroichthyes, and there are a lot of species in that group but they have characteristics that are very particular to chondroichthyes, and the most important of which is probably that they have a cartilaginous skeleton. And so we, you, you can look at these and you'll, you might think uh, they don't look all that similar, but when you delved into them more closely, you'll see that they have very similar tails They have um, scaleless skin. They have remarkably good senses, uh, vision, but especially smell. And they also have a cartilaginous skeleton. That's what makes them chondroichthyes. <laughs> so when we name and classify species, that is a field of biology called taxonomy. It, it classifies species into groups of uh, broader and broader um, features. So taxonomy, when you name species, you give them two names at the species level. One is a particular genus, and the other is the species name. Okay, I made this up. This is from Ice Age. <laughs> but say we look at a bear. If we were to classify the bear, uh, this is, happens to be Ursus americanus, an American black bear. It's in the genus Ursus, which includes uh, bears. They are um, they have some features that are unique to bears. The Ursidae is the family into which the bear belongs. Also, many features in common. The order is Carnivora. Uh, the Carnivora include other species. The one thing they have in common that's obvious in this case is that they're all carnivores, which means they have pointy canines, a slightly different digestive system. The class into which the bear belongs is mammalia. Mammalia because along with all of these other species in that class have mammary glands and hair. The bear belongs in the phylum chordata. Chordata which refers to all animals that have a backbone. They have four features, a postanal tail, they have pharyngeal slits, uh, they have a nautil cord, and they have um, another one, which will eventually um, develop into a spine. Animalia is the kingdom into which the bear belongs, and the animalia are distinguished from the plantae and the fungi and the other groups uh, because they are heterotrophs, so they get their food by eating what's outside them. And the largest classification for the bear is the eukarya, a eukarya. Eukarya is a domain. So I don't know about you, but when I went to university a long time ago, of course, you're just starting now, but there, there was no such thing as eukarya. There were five kingdoms, Animalia, Plantae, Fungi, Monera, and Animalia. Did I say that one already? I forget, but <laughs> there was only five kingdoms. Uh, Protista, sorry, that was the other one. Yeah, 
Now there are many kingdoms, but the important domains are Eukarya and that's one domain. The other two are bacteria and archaea. So those are the broadest groups in classification. Uh, bacteria uh, you saw in the lab, and we're going to study those today. They're very unique. The archaea are also a bacteria, but they tend to be extremophiles. But their cells are so different from the eukarya that they, they get their own group. The eukarya does include kingdoms, um, protist kingdoms. I think there's at least 20 now. You know, with the advent of, of uh, DNA and being able to sequence DNA, the uh, taxonomists are classifying things into more and more groups. So the protists, I still just call them all protists. The plantae, the fungi, and the animalia. Well, those are kingdoms under the eukaryote domain. So the domain bacteria, very diverse, very widespread. Um, there are multiple kingdoms now in the bacteria as well. The domain archaea, they're in extreme environments like super salty lakes and very, very hot environments and even ice environments. The domain eukarya includes the protists. There are multiple kingdoms. Some of them are multicellular, but most of them are unicellular, things like the amoeba. The plantae is another kingdom. Uh, it's, it's a multicellular kingdom, but plantae are autotrophs. They make their own food by photosynthesis. The fungi, uh, they are saprobes, so they, they um, decompose and absorb nutrients from the environment. So that makes them different from the other eukaryote kingdoms. And then animalia multicellular eukaryotes that ingest other organisms. It's interesting that there's so much diversity. So you can think of species as being quite different from each other, but when you look at some features, you realize that there is an enormous unity there as well. For example, say you look at uh, the cilia of a paramecium. A paramecium is a protist. It's a ciliate. It's very, very small. It's a, it's a unicellular. It lives in ponds. And then say you look at the cilia of your own trachea. And you'll notice that they're structured in the same way. Macrotubules that are designed as nine pairs on the outside and two on the inside. And that causes the cilia to be able to move in a whip-like fashion. They have, they have the same uh, function, movement. The function of the cilia is, the cilia of the paramecium is to move it through the water. The function of the cilia in the windpipe is to move uh, particles out of the trachea. Evolution is another theme. How did that picture get in there? I just don't know. <laughs> it might be Brad Pitt. Uh, evolution accounts for life's unity and diversity in that DNA is the code for all life. So the DNA that coded for the cilia was so successful that it persisted throughout the evolution of uh, many millions of years. DNA sequences differ between species, but much of our DNA is the same. For example, we share 40%, which is an enormous amount really, with a small worm called C. elegans that has, I think, 995 cells, and that's it. Um, so when we look at the chromosomes of an individual, this is a karyotype, we notice that the chromosomes are in pairs. Uh, we have 23 pairs, 46. Butterflies, interestingly, have, I think it's like 100 and something pairs of chromosomes. And I think, why is that? The the butterfly is a much simpler animal. Um, I don't really know, but 
some of the reason could be that the chromosomes are left over from the evolutionary past. Uh, much of our DNA doesn't really code for anything. About 98% of it, only 2% of it codes for our proteins. Another theme, of course, uh, evolution by natural selection is a theory that was developed by uh, Charles Darwin. And he made two main points. That species, oh dear. That species showed evidence of descent with modification from common ancestors. Just like you and I are different from our parents, we've descended with a modification. So indeed, the probability of you getting your exact 23 chromosomes from your mom was one in eight trillion. That's the probability of getting that exact 23 chromosomes from your dad, one in eight trillion. So the probability of you getting the exact 46 chromosomes that you have is one in 64 trillion since we have to multiply those together. That is how unique you are. Isn't that amazing? Not only that, but all of your ancestors had to survive to reproduction and, and reproduce successfully. So one of the mechanisms between descent with modification is natural selection. This isn't the only one, but it's the one that Darwin developed. It explains unity and diversity in that it is DNA that unifies all living organisms um, and explains their diversity in that they have different numbers of chromosomes and different sequences of DNA. So I know I'm going through this quite quickly. This is really an overview of the course. We are going to be broaching all of these topics later on. But I wanted you to understand them for the exercise we're doing in a moment, which is um, concept mapping. Natural selection, the one mechanism, one of the mechanisms for evolution uh, proceeds like this. There's a population of organisms. Say they are uh, beetles, but they're not all the same. There's some red beetles, there's some blue beetles, and there are some purple beetles. Uh, there's overproduction and a struggle for existence. Of course, in a perfect world where resources were completely unlimited, the population would, would just grow. There wouldn't be any competition because everyone could get what they wanted. Um, but then, of course, if that were the true of, say, elephants, there would be only elephants on the planet <laughs> because nothing would be there for them to compete for. So some individuals, because they are more fit, they are reproductively successful and others aren't. So maybe in this case, this individual survives, this individual survives, but, but this one does not. So this individual's genes will not make it to the next generation where these ones will because they had adaptations that allowed them to survive to reproduction and those adaptations were genetic. So natural selection occurs when these heritable variations are exposed to environmental factors that favor reproductive success of some individuals over others. So this is a nice diagram of beetles. They have a variation in color. And oh, here's a new incident in the environment of the beetles, a predator, and the predator is selective. So a predator selects uh, the lighter colored beetles because you can see them better. And so the alleles or the genes that give rise to a light color may be lost from the population. The subsequent population has a different set of genes and that is what descent with modification means. Uh, one population has a different set of genes than the previous one. So adaptations of mammals according to their environment. Um, these are all mammals, the human, the cat, the whale, and the bat. We have structures that are called homologous structures. Which in this case are shown as the phalanges. Let's see. Why oh, no, I can erase it somehow. <laughs> I 
I did it again. <laughs> phalanges. Still getting used to writing this way. So the phalanges are adapted. They've developed differently depending on the environment of the animals. So for humans, our phalanges are very flexible. They're not too long, but we're able to grasp things. Um, the cat's phalanges are articulated in such a way that the cat can leap. The whale's phalanges are developed in such a way that they're long and support a fin, a quite a large fin to move through water. The bat's phalanges are thinner, they're long, they're articulated in such a way to support a membrane that allows it to fly like that. Unity and diversity arises from evolution. The forelimb of a bat, a human, a horse, a whale, a flipper, they all share a common skeletal architecture. And that is one area of evidence for evolution. We also look at fossils as Darwin did, provide some, some more evidence of anatomical unity. Um, Darwin proposed that natural selection could give rise over generations to two or more descendant species. Uh, the finch species of the Galapagos Islands, for example. And these relationships are, relationships are shown by a phylogenetic tree like this one. So these are all finches alive today on the Galapagos Islands where Darwin studied. They have slightly different looking beaks, however. So they have evolved from a common ancestor that was on the mainland, you know, where Peru and, and uh, um, Ecuador are, around there. This population migrated to the newly forming Galapagos Islands, and then through competition for resources, they developed different kinds of beaks and diverged into different species. That's called speciation. And when you look at, say, two species like these two here, they're very closely related. Uh, you can tell sometimes by morphology, uh, but more often than not these days we use DNA sequencing. They had a common ancestor here at the branching point. We might not necessarily know what that ancestor looks like, but we know that they had one, just like uh, you and I know that we had uh, parents at one point, and hopefully still do. So the Galapagos Islands is a fascinating place. I've been there myself. I loved every minute of it. Uh, Darwin studied things like this um, tortoise that are on different islands but look slightly different. They have different shells. He noticed the I can't really see that well, that well, I don't think, but that is a marine iguana. And he observed that the marine iguana lived in water uh, to feed, but lived on land to sleep and to mate and do all those other things. Um, he also noticed the blue-footed booby, which impresses its mate by showing its bright blue feet. So we have two main forms of inquiry. Um, science is derived from Latin, it means to know. There's two main kinds, discovery and hypothesis-based science. Discovery science is through observation. Describing natural structures and processes as accurately as possible through observation and analysis of data. This usually takes uh, the acquirement of a lot of data. So this is a, a friend of mine that was studying uh, sea lions in Alaska. And he couldn't do direct experiments with the sea lions, but wanted to know why the sea lions were declining in parts of Alaska. So he and some other people in um, blinds, they watched the colony of sea lions for a, a few seasons to find out more about them. They wanted to know, could it be their behavior that was causing the decline? 
uh, what was going on? Was there more competition from other animals? Yeah, so this is also known as inductive reasoning, deriving generalizations. So they observed, for example, that uh, the sea lion females would look after the young of other females so that uh, they could individually go out and feed. They also noticed that uh, one male would mate with several females. The other type of science practice is called hypothesis-based science, controlled experiments. So with a controlled experiment, you have an experimental group and a control group. A control group is for comparison. Now say we're, we're studying fertilizer. Then we would have to have a big field, another big field, Everything about that field is the same, hopefully, except for the fertilizer that we're applying. So this might be the treatment field or the experimental field, and this will be the control. And we'll plant our plants. Oopsie. But we'll only apply fertilizer to one field. So if we're in the field of marine biology, we use a lot of different tools. Uh, this is this the kind of work I did was using a Van Dorn sampler. That's where you, um, you lower the sampler into a lake and then you close it. You close these when you're at the depth that you want. And then you have the water from that depth including the organisms that are there. Um, a Secchi disc is another type of tool that's used to measure turbidity or how muddy water is. And an Ekman dredge is something that's used to take um, a sample from the bottom of a lake or a river. So it's like a big, um, you know, whatever that machine is called <laughs> that takes dirt, dirt up out of the ground. So it closes and you bring it up and you get a sample of the benthos or the bottom dwelling creatures. Science cannot address supernatural phenomena because hypotheses, sorry, hypotheses must be testable and falsifiable and repeatable. That's very important when designing any kind of experiment. There's a couple of, uh, well, one term in particular theory that I'd like to talk about in that a person who's not a scientist or a biologist might, might say a theory is the same as an hypothesis or a guess, but it is not. A theory is broad in scope, it's supported by a lot of evidence, and it generates hypotheses. For example, the theory evolution of evolution is one, and the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction is another. Science is a social activity. Um, it moves forward because of collaboration. In particular, right now, there's a lot of collaboration between institutions that are developing, developing a vaccine for COVID. So the World Health Organization has gotten these different groups together so that they can collaborate, combine their findings. Hopefully that will result in a vaccine in a shorter period of time. Uh, and competition, is healthy sometimes, although I don't think it's a good idea to hide data or evidence from other researchers, but uh, nevertheless, it does spur people on to greater heights. Collaboration is a great skill um, to learn in your life. Uh, technology, of course, applies scientific knowledge for a specific purpose. Um, I've put a few things under instructor resources. One is about three-dimensional printing, which by now is just kind of commonplace. My, my friend Brian, he makes all kinds of things during, during COVID and isolation. He's got this 3D printer and he's just like make stuff with it all the time. This is a prosthetic that's made with a 3D printer. So they have a lot of, technology has a lot of value in science. 
So here are some themes that we talked about that unify biology. Cells, DNA, biodiversity, evolution, interactions, adaptation, structure, function, energy, scientific method, technology, hierarchy of systems, emergent properties, feedback mechanisms, classifications. Those are all themes that unify biology. And those are all themes that I think we have delved into today quite well. So what I would like to do now is I did.